Richard Branson's plan to cross the Atlantic this year in a hot air balloon has brought a challenge to a race from British balloon maker Don Cameron. The winner will earn a place in the history books and plenty of useful publicity. But to succeed requires skill and luck. Peter Marshall has been talking to the two rival teams. Novelty plus danger equals publicity. And crossing the Atlantic in a hot air balloon is as good a way as any of attracting it. When Richard Branson held a press conference a couple of weeks back to announce his plans for an Atlantic balloon crossing, photographers and film crews were there in strength. Also on the scene, Don Cameron, a British balloon manufacturer who couldn't miss the opportunity to challenge Richard Branson to a race. It's uh, happened rather by accident, really, because uh, the idea of crossing the Atlantic by hot air balloon is something which has only just become possible in the minds of balloonists. And I had been preparing a scheme to do this when through the grapevine I heard that this uh, announcement was going to be made by Richard Branson. So uh, I was more or less trapped into making a race of it. In fact, Don Cameron knows the problems of Atlantic ballooning well. In 1978, he attempted to cross the 2,000 miles in a helium balloon, but splashed down just 100 miles short of the French coast. Salt was poured on the wound when three Americans robbed him of the glory by succeeding with a flight two weeks later. Now the only Atlantic record left to break is the same crossing by hot air balloon. At his factory in Bristol, where balloons come in a variety of sizes and shapes, Don Cameron talks of the challenge and the risks. Oh, ballooning in general isn't terrifying. It's the most sedate and way of flying, and it's, uh, it's the safest way of sporting flying. But uh, being out over the Atlantic in a balloon is slightly terrifying, of course. But a lot of new things have to be done, and uh, it's not like flying the well-proven craft that we fly for fun at weekends. So why do you want to do it? It's a very exciting project. It's, it's difficult to explain why one wants to do it. It's a little bit the same reason as people want to climb mountains. Unlike Richard Branson, who will have a co-pilot, Don Cameron plans to make the crossing on his own. There's already disagreement over where the race will start. Cameron favours Newfoundland, but the Branson balloon is scheduled to leave from New York, making his trip a thousand miles longer. We welcome a race, and uh, obviously it will bring a more of a challenge to it, but we feel that the race should be as we originally launched it from American mainland, from Population Center to Population Center, rather from the last rock in the uh, Atlantic. But both sides agree there's a race on to be the first across the Atlantic, and for both teams that means a sizable problem. Even though we're taking off with nine tons of propane, we, we need sunshine to help to keep this balloon loft. And of course, if we, if we rush off too early, then that, um, that would be a way of being first, but it also means flying in unsuitable conditions. But if he says he's going to do it in May, well, then I shall have to rush and do it in, in April or something like that. It's, it's the competition's going to be like that, is it? Well, I think so. The honor is to be the first hot air balloon to fly the Atlantic. Right, now, last week, you might have read about Richard Branson's latest daredevil plan. Next summer, he's hoping to become the first man to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon. That journey has been tried before in a helium balloon. In 1978, Don Cameron nearly made it across. He was only 100 miles from France when he finally splashed down. Do you say affirmative or negative you have splashed down? On Tuesday, Don Cameron went along to Richard Branson's press conference where he announced his plans for the crossing to the newspapers. He wasn't invited, he just gate-crashed the proceedings and challenged Branson to a balloon race across the Atlantic. Now, Don, why the challenge? Well, of course, <clears throat> the reason for it was that I had been cooking up this idea for some time, and it came to me as a terrible shock when I heard through the ballooning grapevine that uh, Richard Branson was going to do the same thing. Well, Richard Branson says he's going to go in June. How are you going to beat that? Well, June is the best time, and uh, since Tuesday we haven't had a chance to get together to discuss uh, 
what we should do. Well, Richard Branson is leaving the country today to test fly his new super balloon over the Alps, and we've managed to grab him before he left. Richard, now you're a master at manipulating the media. How did it feel to have this gentleman come in and, in a way, steal your thunder? Well, I think the idea of a great balloon race across the Atlantic is wonderful. And um, in fact, I wrote to Malcolm Forbes in America and asked if he'd like to uh, build a balloon and, uh, and maybe get Don to build him a balloon and take off the same term as us. Um, the, only different, the only problem we have is that uh, we feel that the correct place to take off from is New York, and that's where um, we've announced our plans that we're going to take off from. Um, and Don feels that he should take off from Newfoundland, which is a thousand miles nearer England. Don, are you prepared to take off from New York? I'm very reluctant to do it. I think it's something I have to think about, but extremely reluctant because uh, having flown in 78 from Newfoundland, I found the Atlantic is already quite a big place. And um, in principle, it's harder to do with hot air than with gas. So to go back to New York, uh, which is much more attractive, I agree, it's going back a distance which exceeds the present hot air balloon distance record. But if Richard does do it, obviously he is the winner, and it is the longer... It will be a... It's, various things can happen. Uh, if, uh, if we fly first from Newfoundland, well, that would be the first hot air crossing, but on the other hand, it would be a much more magnificent flight from New York. Um, if, he, if he does it first from New York, then, of course, then he's the absolute winner, isn't he? And I have an idea, Don, for you, which is that, is that we should take off from New York, and as we come over Newfoundland, which we will do, you can take off from Newfoundland. And we then race the rest of the way across. So I think we then, um, you know, we, 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 we can achieve what we, we feel that we, we've got to achieve, and that is um, the full crossing of the Atlantic. And, um, and we can have a great race for two-thirds of the way across. It That's might that. be worth looking into something like that. It, 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 we certainly need to study the ground rules. Right. Richard, it's, we've come a long way, haven't we, since the first hot air balloons. I know that yours is going to be a, a 21st century job. There's, there's only one thing I really want to know about it. Are you going to have in-flight movies? <laughs> well, um, no air hostesses, I'm afraid, no movies now. What will you have? What kind of a balloon is it? Um, well, we'll be flying high. I mean, we'll be flying about 35,000 feet. Um, it'll be 30 times larger than uh, your conventional balloon, in fact. Um, bigger than the Albert Hall um, and about three quarters the size of Wembley football pitch. Um, we'll be flying in a pressurized capsule um, and, uh, you know, and, and trying to, to ride as, uh, above some of the worst of the weather. Uh, if something should go wrong um, you know, with the balloon, we can get rid of the balloon and push some buttons and some parachutes will come out. I mean, it would be very similar to the uh, capsule that uh, went into space. Don, the dangers of crossing that kind of expanse of ocean? Well, it's just being, being over the ocean. You, you, you mustn't get lost and, and you must have the ability to, to survive for enough time for someone to give you a lift. Richard, com coming over to you, you, you're obviously preparing this very carefully. What dangers have you heard about? I think the biggest danger is, is thunderstorms. I mean, Don's much more experienced than me, so he may, you know, may, may or may not agree, but I mean, if you, if, you get in, absolutely, yeah. if, you, if you get into a thunderstorm, the balloon's going to be shot, shot right up into the air and, and the balloon most likely ripped to pieces. And, 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 and trying to come down in a thunderstorm would be very difficult. So I think that's the thing that most balloonists fear the most. Yes, this, in fact, was the end of our 78 flight. We got into a region of thunderstorms and uh, we decided it was getting just a bit too dangerous, so we put down on the water. You both look very different. You're both attempting to do the same thing, cross the Atlantic, but we, here we've got Richard in a very snazzy cardigan, and then we've, next to him we've got our second adventurer in a pinstriped suit. Are you two different kinds of adventurer? Richard, what about you? Uh, well, I don't know, Don, um, and so I can't really say, but I suspect that um, the, the behind the clothes we're most likely quite similar people, I think. Um, you know, but obviously it sounds like we're, we're both the kind of people who uh, want to have a go, for, a go for something, and um, that Don, that Don should speak for himself. Anyway. Don, what about you? You don't, ex I, you know, with the greatest respect, you don't exactly look like someone's going to leap into a balloon and fly off across well, the Atlantic. Well, I suppose that's right, but uh, I only put this on for today, of course. <laughs> One doesn't get into a balloon in a, in a suit. Um, hard to say. I think it's the same sort of motivation, anyway, to do this kind of thing. Are people surprised when they know that you're an adventurer? that you'll do these things? Well, I don't know if I am, really. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing to do, but 
I always say I'm one of the world's greatest cowards. If I thought it was dangerous, I wouldn't be doing it. Well, look, you obviously are two very different kinds of people, but there's something about the challenge of getting across this immense expanse of ocean. Who's going to win? Richard? I don't, in a sense, think it's a matter of whether one of us beat each other that um, is the issue. Um, I think the issue is whether either of us will actually get across the Atlantic. Um, when you think that no hot air balloon has ever attempted to cross the Atlantic, and um, people believe that it's actually impossible for a hot air balloon to go that far. Um, the furthest a hot air balloon's ever been is 800 miles and over land. Um, I think the, the battle we have is the battle against the elements and the, the battle against the weather. Um, and the question mark really is whether either of us will actually um, make it the whole way across. Don, what about you? How do you see the challenge? Are you going to make it across? Well, it's a brave man who can be sure of anything in this kind of game. As Richard said, the weather is everything. The greatest danger is that uh, the balloon runs into an area of thunderstorms or bad weather. This is what happened in our 1978 attempt uh, within sight of the coast of France. So it's a, it's a gamble, but it's a, it's a wonderful game to play. Wonderful, and you're risking your life. Well, I hope not. Uh, it's possible to do it reasonably safely, I think, with enough precautions. Um, I'm certainly a, quite a coward, so I wouldn't be doing it if I thought it was too dangerous. Well, whoever gets here first, I would imagine you're both winners. Good luck, and thanks very much. Thank you. Later today, Britain's leading balloonist, Don Cameron, will announce details of his plans to become the first man in the history of flight to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon. But this isn't simply a question of one man's battle against the elements, because Don Cameron has challenged the pop millionaire Richard Branson to a race. They've still to work out the details of the great transatlantic balloon race, but here on Breakfast Time, we'll bring you regular progress reports on how the competitors are shaping up including live coverage of the race itself. To begin with, Guy Mitchellmore has been to see how Don Cameron is preparing. We'd either be lying here in the, in the middle of the floor, uh, or else up on the bench. Lying on his back, surrounded by furniture, is the man who hopes to find a place in history. But this is no eccentric parlour game, just the first stage in a deadly serious quarter of a million pound bid to cross the Atlantic. Nine years ago, Don Cameron tried and failed. Using a combination of hot air and helium gas, he came within a few hours of success, but ended up in the Bay of Biscay. Since then, a gas balloon has made the flight, but no one has succeeded using just hot air. The flight time of a hot air balloon is limited by the amount and weight of fuel which can be carried. Don will have about 100 hours to fly the 1,200 miles from Newfoundland to Europe. He must average at least 25 miles an hour. If he doesn't, he'll get wet. Richard Branson's flight plan takes him from New York, a thousand miles further. Both men will be looking for just the right gap between the weather systems which cross the Atlantic to Europe, rather like hopping on a vast meteorological escalator. Everything hinges on who hops off at the other end first. We had a name to do this, and uh, we were quite shocked when we heard that Richard Branson was going to do the same thing. Um, so it's very much a race, uh, albeit with no structured rules. It's just a question of who can do this first. Is there any um, needle between the two camps? Well, I think both camps probably wish the other camp wasn't there. Our reaction certainly was that uh, that's our ocean out there and uh, keep off it. But you can't really say that. So we, we have to have a bit of a competition to see who can do it. It's uh, an enormous hot air balloon. It's um, almost twice as big as has ever been built before. Um, our competition, of course, are talking about going even bigger, and um, that for them must be a, a big worry. Getting an enormous balloon down is, uh, like this is, is really the principal problem at the end of the flight. Um, the, the balloon will be so lightly loaded that it may only be about seven degrees warmer than the atmosphere. So it just takes a little bit of sunshine to make this thing fly on its own. The other balloon is, they're talking about casting the balloon loose as they land, and that is a way of tackling the problem. Um, the approach uh, I've been favoring is to actually come off it airborne onto a smaller balloon, 
which would then give the option of uh, landing in a more controlled fashion. Time is of the essence. At Don's factory in Bristol, a prototype of the massive balloon is nearing completion. But held up by the weather, the balloon remains firmly on the ground, as does the recumbent yeah. balloonist. So you, that's not a lot to lie on. And is that the correct height of the benches? No, they're almost correct. They're going to be Together, Don and the project director, Alan Noble, are planning the dimensions of the tiny transatlantic capsule. There will be no club class on this flight. In a matter of weeks, those measurements have been turned into fiberglass. And just days before the press launch, the first capsule is ready. Will this um, <clears throat> take my weight? Yeah. For Don Cameron and his co-pilot, this will be home for four long days over the Atlantic. Specifically designed for this height, so you saw that... Um... Alan seems happy, but then he's not going on the flight. This small box and a million cubic feet of hot air are all which will stand between the two pilots and the icy Atlantic Ocean. I think probably a little claustrophobic. Uh, of course, eventually it will have uh, a porthole on each side, which will help. Um, I think I'll have to duck down and see what it's like inside before I can really answer that question. Actually, it's not bad at all. It just has a strange resonance. It's a little bit like being in a church. Where would, ideally, you like to land? Oh, my front garden. Out here <laughs> would, be, would be just perfect. But anywhere, of course, from Norway to Africa would be quite acceptable. A balloon maker from Bristol has entered the race to become the first person to fly a hot air balloon across the Atlantic. Millionaire Richard Branson had already planned a record-breaking attempt this summer. Well, now Don Cameron has challenged him to a transatlantic race. And today, Mr. Cameron revealed his secret weapon. He says he'll be using two balloons for the attempt. One of them will be the biggest man-carrying balloon in the world. The Bristol balloonist Don Cameron has revealed a daring plan to fly across the Atlantic and beat Richard Branson to the record. His idea is to start off the flight in the world's biggest balloon and then in mid-air change to a smaller one to land on this side of the Atlantic. Details of this tricky changeover were released by the veteran flyer in London today. Pop millionaire Branson launched his transatlantic challenge two months ago. At the time, he thought the field was clear to make the fast hot air crossing in June, but he reckoned without Don Cameron. Nine years ago, he almost became the first to cross the Atlantic in a helium balloon. Cruelly, that attempt failed, beaten by the wind changing. Now it looks like the race is on this the summer. Cameron told Pressman today that he'd be ready, and Virgin will almost certainly start too. It's a little bit of a, a tortoise and hare race because they have very much higher technological aim than we have. They're flying higher, they're pressurized, they have a very much bigger balloon. And these things, if they do well, will be to our disadvantage. But on the other hand, they're a very big technical uh, step to take. Our, our system is essentially simpler, but still quite a big jump ahead of present balloon technology. When the last attempt failed, Don Cameron had to ditch in the sea. This summer, though, he'll have a new secret weapon to at least help. And that's a valid method of tackling the problem. Our approach is a little bit different. It is to actually deflate the balloon in mid-air and to fly away on a smaller balloon, which we have attached as a kind of um, dinghy to the main balloon, and then make the final landing on a fairly orthodox balloon. It makes the final landing much easier, but uh, gives us a mid-air trapeze act, which is a little bit frightening to do. Acrobatics apart, all they need now at the Bristol Balloon Factory is some favourable weather. Whoever loses this race will have to pay £50,000 to charity. And it should be some race, I guess. Well, the what?
The race to be the first person ever to cross the Atlantic in a hot air balloon is really hotting up, with both Richard Branson and his challenger, Don Cameron, working flat out to snatch the record for themselves. The two teams have come up with radically different strategies, but both are, both are equally determined to win. Richard Branson intends to lift off from New York and fly the first thousand miles over land to Newfoundland and then head out across the Atlantic at 30,000 feet in a pressurized capsule. He hopes to land in London, but the wind could blow him to anywhere in Europe. Don Cameron believes it would be too dangerous to fly over inhabited land with nine tons of propane gas hanging from his balloon, so he plans to take off from Newfoundland a thousand miles nearer and fly more slowly at 7,000 feet. Richard Branson has already completed some test flights in Spain. Meanwhile, Don Cameron, dogged by the British weather, has been waiting to test a completely new kind of balloon, which he announced at a recent press conference. Guy Mitchellmore has been following our intrepid balloonist as he contends with the elements, the opposition, and first of all, the press. A little happier to the camera, that's fine, yes. Nice and happy, lovely. Looking uncomfortably like a pair of glove puppets, Don Cameron and his co-pilot, Major Timothy Davy, stand sheepishly before the cameras, popping out of the hatch of the gondola, which they hope will carry them across the Atlantic, slung beneath a colossal hot air balloon. The only thing is, what can you reach? And we're going to have to mop this up. You've got the wires here, and you could be cutting them off. But despite the optimism of the launch, test flights are well behind schedule. The team badly need a break in the dismal weather, and this week it came. It's 7 a.m. in a park on the outskirts of Bristol, and a prototype of the transatlantic balloon is about to make her maiden flight. It is, in fact, two balloons in one, the double layer of material acting like double glazing to keep the heat in. Huge propane burners send out sheets of flame, and rapidly, the balloon takes shape. So everything appears to be ready for the first flight of the Zanussi test balloon. But the transatlantic balloon itself will be very, very much bigger than this. If you can imagine, it will be over two and a half times the height and ten times the capacity. Quite a spectacular balloon, bigger than any balloon which has ever been built before. Now, it looks as though they're almost ready to take off, so I'd better go and fasten my seatbelt. Right, okay, which way in? This side. Okay. Oops. Right. Very close. But even at the very moment of takeoff, the weather, which has caused so many problems, threatened to keep us on the ground. What is this weather doing, Owen? Well, I think it's deteriorating. On this occasion, however, it abated, and the next moment we took flight. What a wonderful sensation. It's rather as though the ground drops away from you rather than the, the, the balloon actually takes off. And listen to that. Absolute peace and quiet. What a sensation. Don, I, I see exactly why you do it now. Yes, yes. What nice an extraordinary way to travel. The problem I'm led to believe about uh, flying a balloon is that it reacts quite slowly so that you have to do everything about 20 seconds in advance, yeah. otherwise uh, you end up in trouble. <laughs> think what's going on. Well, Don, we're, we're now up in the, the test balloon. What have you learned mm -hmm. about this, uh, the characteristics of this balloon so far? Well, it's a little bit different. It doesn't cool quite so rapidly as a normal balloon. As you can see, I've misjudged it a bit. <laughs> um, but we'll just wait and she'll cool down. I can see now what it is which attracts you to hot air balloon. I mean, how would you describe it for somebody who's not able to be up here with us this morning? I always find it difficult to describe. It's a sort of magic. Well, you, you see it for yourself, but how do you put it into words? <laughs> right, now we're, some grass, uh, we're now coming in ready. the moment I've of truth. I've got the red line which opens the panel. OK. What will I have to do when we actually touch down? You notice we're moving a little bit more rapidly now. OK. And there we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, now the thing collapses all of its own, and that's it. 
we're down. This is the less glamorous side of ballooning, struggling amongst the cow pads to put the thing away. For me, the flight was a memorable experience, and for the team, the first small step in the long and treacherous road across the Atlantic. The Bristol balloonist Don Cameron's been drawn into an unwanted race against time. Later on this summer, you may remember, he's hoping to become the first man to fly a hot air balloon across the Atlantic. Well, his plans suffered a bit of a hitch when the American fabric for his special balloon was held up at the customs. But this afternoon, they finally decided to release the material. Mr. Cameron says the delays cost him valuable time. Well, that much-needed nylon fabric eventually arrived at four this afternoon, and it means the cross-Atlantic attempt is now on, although it's likely to be a few days late. Work on the balloon is already underway. It'll be 150 foot tall, about the height of Nelson's column, and will lift something like 10 tons. Cameron estimated it'll take five days to cross, and it'll burn about eight tons of propane. Well, that missing material's caused a few headaches. Now, obviously, we can actually see people working straight away on this, uh, you're going to reach the deadline all right? I think we may be a few days late, but um, nothing too serious. The only worry is that all the hardware may now have to go on a container. The balloon envelopes may not be ready, so we may have to fly those out by air. So what will keep this ginormous balloon in the air for five days over the Atlantic? Well, the answer, of course, is gas. And this is equivalent to the amount of gas that will be burnt on the journey. And I can tell you the containers are about 500 pounds each. Once used, they'll be discarded. Well, what happens if the gas runs out or the balloon should spring a leak? Well, the answer is this. This is the gondola. Obviously, it's got to float because it may have to survive in mid-Atlantic for several days and maintain two men before the rescue services can reach them. Still, they're going to practice this week, apparently on the south coast. They convinced that this will float. Well, fingers crossed. In the meantime, I'm going down to have another look. So, in mid-June, the Cameron-Branson race is on. Cameron setting off from Canada, Branson from America. A prototype of Cameron's balloon is expected to make a trial flight from Ashton Court tomorrow evening. If the weather stays as fine as this, it'll be up, up and away. The race is on to be the first to cross the Atlantic by hot air balloon. Bristol's Don Cameron has taken up the challenge and yesterday saw the test flight of his balloon at Ashton Court. Rosie Reed was there. Yachtsmen can sail around the world. For mountaineers, there's always Everest. But a solo crossing of the Atlantic remains the ultimate challenge for balloonists. Well, now Don Cameron's come up with the design he thinks will do the job and beat his millionaire rival, Richard Branson, in a £50,000 race across the ocean. It's yet another first for Britain's leading balloon maker who specialises in quirky designs. This, his latest model, is called the Gondola. Made of lightweight black plastic, it'll absorb heat from the sun and use less gas. The two-man crew, Don Cameron and Jim Howard, will squeeze into the watertight shell. They'll carry enough food and fuel to survive for up to five days. We hope for three days, uh, four days is acceptable, and five days we can just about manage. Anything more than five days and we're pushing our luck. The, the, the capsule is designed in a similar way to a dinghy, that is, it's got um, water ballast tanks on the bottom, so when you drop in to the water, they, they fill up and give you some sort of stability. We have parachutes and we have the normal one-man life rafts, so we should be all right, we should be reasonably safe. Both teams involved are being very secretive over tactics and the balloon's precise design. Richard Branson's balloon, they say, will be much bigger and fly much higher. The one reason we've probably got a better chance of success is that our balloon has got the two biggest wimps in the whole world in it, so we don't come down. We're terrified of actually dropping in the sea. Balloonist Don Cameron has taken to the air for the first time in the capsule which he hopes will earn him a place in history. Ever since he announced his intention of beating the Virgin boss Richard Branson in the bid to become the first hot air balloonist to cross the Atlantic, he's been committed, of course, to a, a hectic schedule of test flights. The colossal 150-foot high balloon he will use for the flight is still being worked on, but the gondola, it's a very special flight capsule, is now completed and has just completed its maiden flight. And, of course, our man Guy Mishamore was there when it was.
a perfectly still evening in late spring and another important test flight for the Cameron team. With just over a month to go before they leave for America, there's a new urgency in the preparations as more and more of Don's ideas take shape. Can we take the okay, no, up, this evening, it's not the balloon, but the transatlantic gondola that's under test. In this yellow capsule, the two men will spend up to four long days as they cross the Atlantic. At the controls, co-pilot Major Jim Howard. While this thing's flying, it's going to be wonderful. The only thing is, I hope we don't have to do anything else other than fly with it. Is it more difficult than you expected on the ground? No, no, it was terrific. What about the prospect of trying to sail this? I mean, if in the unlikely event we come down to the Atlantic Ocean? Uh, well, that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have heard that the reason that we're going to win this, rather than Branson, is because you've got the two biggest wimps in the whole world in this capsule. And so we're terrified of coming down, so we're not going to. Can you swim? Oh, yes, yeah. A final look at the map, and the team is ready for the capsule's maiden flight. Well, that's it. It's easy. Is it? Of course that would. It's simple. They're exactly the same in um, Newfoundland. What a beautiful evening. Mm. Also, yeah, oh no, it's not, is it? Um, what is it? The other one was wash. What's this one? Is it cook or cool? I think it's cook, isn't it? That's a kilo. No, it doesn't matter. After just a few minutes in flight, the two men start to settle down in their home from home, a thousand feet above the fields of Avon. In this tiny gondola, they will eat, sleep, plot their course and fly the mighty balloon which they hope will carry them into the record books. Yes, it moves a little bit down here, doesn't it? Yeah. Bit of, um... Well, if you carry on flying, I'll just uh, go to sleep for a moment. Shall I tell you if we just about to crash or just... Do, do, yes, yeah. yes, but I mean, point that out. You want to make it big first, just tell you quietly. Yes, pass me a moment. What a beautiful house, Donald. Oh, is that Flying over a beautiful house, yeah. That's not the Gable Forum, is it? It's about here. Yeah, we're yeah, right. Oh, that's Lord Rexall's place, I expect. While Jim and Don float peacefully across the countryside, project manager Alan Noble pursues the balloon on the ground, a frantic chase through the country lanes. Even this close to home, however, communications problems start to make life difficult. So it doesn't want to remind us of the night. <laughs> Retrieve to balloon, retrieve to balloon. Do you read over? Retrieve to balloon, retrieve to balloon. Nothing heard over. <laughs> Who's that? Yes, it is. I couldn't get you on 129.9, but the telephone seems to be working well. Getting the gondola airborne was comparatively effortless, but bringing it down again is still something of an unknown quantity. There's a lot of cows. I'd better be careful there. No, the cows are on here well clean, aren't they? Can. Yeah, don't get under it. Can, can, you, can you watch that camera for me? Just get in. Make sure it doesn't... Yeah. Okay. Now hold it, lads. Hold, hold it. it down. Good. The handle's on the bottom. Okay. Oh, well done, mate. That's it. A safe landing and a successful maiden flight for the gondola. Surrounded by small children, large farmers and half the air training corps, the unflappable Don Cameron calls for assistance. Yes, we've, we've, we've got a turn out of the ATC, which is quite splendid. Carried aloft like some trophy of battle, the air cadets remove the capsule. It passed this test with flying colours, but would it keep the crew alive if they ditched in the middle of the stormy Atlantic? Well, there's only one way to find out, and you can join us again on breakfast time for the sea trials. final stages of testing. Like all true adventures, there is a high degree of risk. If he doesn't make it, he will splash down in the middle of the Atlantic, up to a thousand miles from land. Now, in his latest of his films, a Guy Mitchell Moore has been finding out how he would survive. While Don Cameron is planning for success, 
he must also be prepared for failure. The Zanussi team are confident that their revolutionary capsule, in which the two men will spend the four-day flight, performs well in the air. Assured of its airworthiness, they must now find out if it's seaworthy as well. The hostile and forbidding Atlantic has little in common with the North Croft Leisure Centre in Newbury, but it was here that the tiny capsule was launched. Jim, if we get into this position in the middle of the Atlantic... The gondola, as it's known, for once living up to its name, bobbed around with remarkable stability to the satisfaction and relief of the team and to the bewilderment of at least one casual observer. Proving that the gondola floats in a swimming pool is one thing, but how would it fare if it really did end up in the middle of the Atlantic? Well, that's what we've come here, to the middle of the Solent, to try and find out. The gondola, slung beneath a Navy helicopter, was lowered into the sea. Could the two men really survive for what might be days in this tiny yellow box, battered by the untamed strength of the Atlantic Ocean? Don Cameron and co-pilot Major Jim Howard, dressed in their bright red survival suits, gingerly climbed aboard. Watch the red things on the dinghies. Let us drift away before you start the engines. Is our drogue deployed all right? Although it's just over six feet long and weighs less than 100 pounds, the gondola is much tougher than it at first appears. It's built of Kevlar, a material used for jet fighters, racing cars and now transatlantic balloon capsules, which is both extremely light and very strong. Once at sea, everything seemed to work fine, including the communications. How's it going? Terrific, I've just had a phone call from my wife. <laughs> What's the object of sitting in this thing today? The main aim, obviously, is to see how it reacts, and it's reacting beautifully, probably better than we thought. So far, you might have noticed that despite the best endeavours of the team, neither Jim nor Don had got wet. But their run of good luck came to an abrupt and chilly end as they learned how to deploy their life rafts. Well, now, where's the bailer? It would be wrong to describe Major Jim Howard as in his element, but he coped. Is it as cold and uncomfortable as it looks? Yeah, it's certainly not very comfortable. <laughs> Their damp ordeal over, the two men were hoisted aboard the helicopter at the end of an exhausting but successful day. So what have they learned? It rides reasonably well in, in choppy conditions. Um, not luxury transport, of course, but um, not too bad, quite survivable. And, of course, the exercise with the Navy gives us tremendous confidence of, uh, of what they can do. You were the one um, below being tossed about I in the capsule. How did it feel? Well, I, th I thought I'd be terrified when I went out on that capsule, and it's reassuring to know that I will be terrified. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was very good. The, the capsule behaved perfectly. Their contingency plans have worked, and the yellow gondola has proved itself afloat. Having prepared for failure, the team can now continue to plan for success, optimistic that that was the first and last time they would find themselves at sea. <laughs>